Hello and welcome to Oak Hills Church. We are so glad that you're with us today, whether you're watching online or here with us in person, welcome. If you are a guest with us, we want you to know it doesn't matter where you are on your faith journey, you can start here. And as a guest, we want you to know that, you, that you're with us. And so if you would just take a moment and introduce yourself. Uh, and so if you're watching online, you can introduce yourself by going to the home page of our website, clicking on the Start Here, Stay Connected button and filling out that real simple form. We would greatly appreciate it. If you're with us in person after the service, head outside the auditorium doors, head to your left, you'll see a resource center there with some cards and some pens. Fill out that card, drop it in the bucket, and you have introduced yourself we would greatly appreciate that. We just want you to be a part of this community because we have some awesome people uh, that are a part of this awesome community and this awesome church. And uh, we experienced some great community this past Wednesday as all of our fall Wednesday night ministry kicked off. It starts at 6.30 and goes to 7.45 and we have something for kids, youth, adults, everyone and we want you to be a part of it we encourage you to go to our website and check those things out and then join us on wednesday nights if you're a man here at oak hills church we want you to be a part of a small group and we have five small groups starting uh, and these groups range from talking about life sports missions and uh, if you want to just connect to other men here at oak hills church we encourage you to go to our website check out those groups and sign up for one and just join the great community that we have here uh, also coming up uh, uh, is uh, on Tuesday, the 21st, we are having a pause and pray event. Uh, in 2021, we decided as a church that the 21st of every month, we would just take a moment and pray for our church, our family, our community, our country, and our world. And so coming up on the 21st, we wanna invite you to be a part of this, where whether it's at the beginning of your day, maybe it's on your lunch break, just take 15 minutes, just pause and just pray. And we believe that when we pray and we invite God into our lives, into our communities, into our moments, that God really shows up and, and does some incredible things. So we wanna invite you to pause and pray this 21st. Uh, then coming up on October 22nd through the 24th, we have a Pacham in Terrace retreat. This is a great opportunity in the midst of our busy lives, our busy schedules, the craziness of all that's going on in our lives, you can just take a moment and uh, experience God and hear from God uh, for in silence and in solitude. This retreat is going to be a great opportunity where if you need clarity and direction from God, you can take it. Uh, but the registration for this event ends on Wednesday, September 22nd. So you need to register by then. So we encourage you, go online, sign up for this event, register because it is going to be a great opportunity to just hear from God and experience God. In the Bible, it says that uh, uh, God asks us to bring into the storehouse the tithes and offerings. And God says that if you do this, you just test me. You will experience the blessings of God in your life. And God asks us to test them. And so we want to thank so much of you who have really just taken a step of faith and just given of your tithes and offerings and been faithful in so many ways. We are so thankful because you have just helped the ministries here at Oak Hills Church and the ministries to our community. Uh, if you would like to give, you can give online on the app or send a check into Oak Hills Church. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, as we enter into worship this, uh, this morning, I'm, I'm going to read from Psalm 147. It starts, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is Fitting. I love, I love how he puts that. For it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the, the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars, and he gives to all of them their names. Great is the Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. And then later it says, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders and fills you with the finest of wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? 
He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for who you are. We are awed by your majesty, by your greatness, by your power. We thank you that we have this time set aside where we can honor you, we can fix our hearts on you, we we draw our attention toward you, we turn our affection toward you. For you are worthy of our praise, you are worthy of our, our song. It is fitting to bring a song of praise to you, Lord. And so we invite you. We invite your presence to fill the atmosphere where we are, that you would be enthroned upon the praises of your people, Lord. We thank you.
that in times of tension or conflict or difficulty that we would not be so overwhelmed and or so impressed by our circumstances that we take our eyes off you, but that we would take it as an opportunity to trust you more deeply, to depend on you more fully. Lord, I pray that, that you would examine us that we would allow you complete access to our minds, complete access to our hearts and souls. That you would point out lovingly, graciously, harshly if needed, anything that is in our life that does not look like you, anything that is not of you, anything that is not pointing toward you. That we would learn to trust you, to devote our lives completely and wholeheartedly to you in all that we do, in our everyday moments, from our highs and our lows and everything in between, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for your kindness, for your correction. We give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise forever and ever, forever and ever. And we pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. And together, everyone said, amen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our online service today. It is so great to have you. I'm going to begin my message with a question, and it's this question. What if God appeared to you and said to you, hey, I want you to put me to the test. What if God said, I'd like you to start doing something that, number one, uh, will draw you closer to me. If God said that, it'll draw us closer together. Number two, if you start doing this, it'll help you know it's really valuable in life. And number three, if you start doing this one thing, and you put me to the test, what will happen is you will experience great blessing in your life and in your family. Um, this idea of the test is what I want to talk to you about today. And I want to ask you as we begin, if God appeared to you and he asked you that question, hey, put me to the test, you know, what would you say? Would you say yes? Uh, today as we continue in our series 10, I'm going to talk to you about this very thing, putting God to the test. Before I begin the message, we're going to listen to a story by one of our Oak Hills Church families who trusted God. They put God to the test, and they found out that God provided for them and blessed them because they trusted God. They put God to the test. So let's take a look at this video, and then I'll share my message. About five years ago, I was a working mom with two young kids, and like so many in that new role in life, I was um, really struggling, struggling to find a way to just handle everything that I felt like was being thrown at me at the time. And after one particularly hard day, my husband, Javier, and I decided that something had to go. And so we started to explore the idea of a stay-at-home parent. Originally, we assumed it would be me, mostly because I was never particularly career-driven or motivated, whereas Javier had moved here from Colombia and was finally starting to live this American dream that he had envisioned for himself and had worked for, for honestly, a really long time. And it took us a while to realize that that was our plan, but that wasn't God's plan. And that took us a bit to come to terms with, both as a couple, but also individually. But we did. And then we started to look at the financial side of this. The, can we do this? Can we be starting our family and essentially cut our income in half? And the answer was no, <laughs> we can't do this. It's not gonna work. And so we fought it for a while. We fought it for a long time. We thought, we'll just figure something else out. Let's keep thinking about it. And eventually we decided to listen and to obey. And it was one of the 
biggest ways that God has shown up in our finances and also in other areas of our life that we could have never anticipated at the time. We will still look at our budget and think, how is this working? <laughs> this shouldn't be working. It doesn't look like it's working, but we know that it is working because we had given it fully to God. We had said, Lord, okay, we're going to take this leap of faith and here is what we have for you to work with. <laughs> so we're going to step off this cliff now, even though we're terrified and we trust you to catch us when we fall. And he did, and he has ever since. And he has shown up in ways, when major ways, since we decided to trust that the plan that God has for us is better than the plan that we had for ourselves. My thanks to Sally and Javier for, for Sally sharing her story today. I especially like you know, just the part about praying about it, listening to the Lord, and then trusting God, and then hearing the story about how God provided for them. If you've never read the prophet Malachi that's found in the Old Testament, the passage that we're going to consider today might surprise you because of its strong language and because of its bold promises. But we're going to read it. We're going to read the text today. I'm going to read it all the way through. And then we're going to break it down a little bit for my sermon today. So let's take a look here at Malachi chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 6. I am the Lord and I do not change. This is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great, you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Can you believe it? Here, through the prophet Malachi, God says, put me to the test. But I want you to notice something that's really important. When you hear that, put me to the test, it, it's maybe easy to miss exactly what God is saying here. So I want you to notice something really important. Notice that God doesn't say here, put me to the test by paying up, by paying your fair share, by paying what you owe me. And then, and then maybe I'll be nice to you. No, God first says, put me to the test. Listen, put me to the test by returning to me, by returning to me, by returning to the original agreement, agreement we had. And once you do that, watch what happens. There's a story that Jesus told in the New Testament. And the story is about a, a, a son who lived in the safety and the blessing of his father's home. And one day, the son just demanded his inheritance from his father, and he left. He just walked out. The story is often called the parable of the prodigal son. I think a more accurate title would be the story of a loving father, because that father is an example of God to us. Um, If you've ever read Luke 15 where you can read the story that Jesus told, you'd know that throughout the whole story, the father is faithful and loving, and his commitment and love for his son never changes. Even after his son selfishly asks for his inheritance and takes off, the father patiently waits for his son to return. Well, while the language may seem a bit harsh, this is essentially what Malachi is saying in the text, God says, hey, my character hasn't changed. I have not changed. I love you, Israel. 
I made you into a nation. I've blessed you. And that has never changed, God says. However, you walked away from me. You walked away from our agreement. You want blessing from me, but you don't want a relationship with me. Does that sound at all familiar to you? Because it does to me. God, I want your blessing. I want your protection. I want your provision. I want health and wealth. I want you to give me a good life, God, but I'm not really that interested in a relationship with you. I'd kind of like to do my own thing, but I want all that stuff. Um, this is what's so amazing. I found that when I've lived with that kind of attitude, it doesn't affect God's character. God continues to love me, and God continues to give to me and to bless me. And here's what God always does when I live with that kind of attitude. God gives me the opportunity to return to him. Let's take a look here. I'm going to pull this from the text we read. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me, and I will return to you. To you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? See, God always gives us an opportunity to return. In the story that Jesus told, the son who ran off and spent his inheritance soon became aware of his rebellion and his rejection of his father's blessing and his father's love. And he humbly, like really humbly, he returned home to ask for his father's forgiveness. And he readily and quickly received that forgiveness from his father. Notice in our text, this group of people that Malachi is speaking to. In response to God asking them to return, their response to that question from God, or telling them to return, their response is like a cynical question. How can we return when we have never gone away. I mean, that's what they were saying. What do you mean, God? We never went away. See, the people Malachi was speaking to said, what is God talking about, Malachi? We go to the temple every Sunday. The place is full. We all go and worship, and then we go home. And then we watch football. No, no, that's not in there. But anyway, that's basically what they were saying to Malachi. Like, why is God saying that? But God knew this. God knew he did not have their hearts. He didn't have their full devotion. See, now here's the important point for all of us who follow Jesus, all of us who call ourselves Christians. We need to check ourselves to see if God has our hearts, like our wholehearted devotion. If you're married and you went through a terrible situation where your spouse had an affair, then you might say that he or she cheated on you. Why would you say that? Uh, because their love is not wholeheartedly committed to just you. They have or had other lovers. This is a challenge for all of us who follow Jesus. We often have other lovers, other idols that we worship. And yet we go to the temple and we say to God, what do you mean return to you, God? When did we ever go away? We're here at the temple every week. And by far, here's the thing, by far one of the most popular level, lo lovers that we Christians cheat on God with is money, especially in the West and especially in our country, in the United States of America, and we are so blessed. And here's the thing, cheating on God with the sexy and sensual idol of money is what Malachi says is the very reason that we need to return. Let's take a look. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me with the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Uh, we have a family friend who, a couple years ago, uh, went through a really tough divorce. And then a couple years later, 
She met someone and she remarried. She has two beautiful kids. She presently struggles with her ex-husband in one area. She tries really hard not to, to struggle with this. But here's the thing. He never pays for any of the expenses for their two children. Now, do you think that her frustration is about the money? I mean, maybe a little, but it really isn't. No, see, she struggles with why he doesn't want to invest in his children. Why money seems to be more important than sharing in the responsibility of parenting his children in this very important way. In Malachi's day, the people had lost their love for God. They were not giving tithes. So the Levites or the priests, those who led the worship in the temple, who were supposed to be provided by the other 12 tribes of Israel, um, they, they basically went to work to earn a living. The people were neglecting their God-given responsibilities to care for the temple and for the service of worship. Folks, listen. Everything we have is from God. So when we refuse to return to him, a part of what he's, you know, given to us, if we, if we ref- refuse to, to return even, even a part of what he's given to us, we actually rob God. It's much like our family friend who, who wonders about her ex-husband. Why doesn't he want to take care of our children this way? Why is his heart closer to money than it is to our kids. But here's the thing. What happens when we are in close relationship to God? What is the result of returning to a wholehearted relationship with God? Well, um, we will steward our lives and resources then where God's heart is with the work that God wants to do on the earth. It won't be a burden to do this. It won't be an obligation. It won't be a duty. It won't be cheating. It will be a joy. It will be a joy. And get this. We will experience, when we do this, we will experience incredible blessing. Here's the results of returning to God. Take a look. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great, you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies armies. So uh, notice what God says through the prophet about the two things that will happen when we bring the tithe into the storehouse. One, we see it right here, the needs of the temple or the local church will be met. Okay, that's one thing that'll happen. But secondly, the other thing that'll happen, God will pour out blessing into our lives when we return to God, into this wholehearted relationship with God, then we will experience blessing in our lives. I'm not sure this has to do with, I'm not sure exactly what this has to do with, what I'm going to tell you here in a minute. Um, It probably has to do with my personality as much as anything. But I've always been bothered when us preachers imply that if you give to God, then you will get from God. It's always bothered me. But see, there is nothing implied, and notice this, there is nothing implied in this passage of Scripture about having a transactional relationship with God. I think too many friendships and too many marriages operate that way, and they're incredibly, in my opinion, they tend to be incredibly shallow and unfulfilling. I'll do this for my husband so I can get this from my husband. I'll do this for my friend so I can get this from my friend. But see, Malachi has made it very clear that God does not change. God's love for us, God's commitment to us is not transactional. 
at all. It's not dependent on our love for him or our commitment to him. So I think it's important for us to know what Malachi, first of all, is not saying here about God to us. He's not saying, hey, everyone, this is really a great thing. If you give money to God, God will give you a whole bunch of money, and this is a great way to get rich. It's not what Malachi is saying that is the message from God. But Malachi is saying this is God's message. When we're in a loving relationship with God and trust God with all he's given us to steward and to manage, we will experience, and it's right here in the text, these are God's words, not mine, we will experience, here it is in the text, blessing so great we won't have enough room to take it in. Think about it. That's God's promise. And he's saying, put me to the test and see if this happens in your life. Last week, I mentioned that I believe that for the 41 years that my wife Melody and I have been married, uh, I believe we've been far more blessed living off the 90% of our income than we ever would have been living off the 100%. Uh, Yes, we can tell you many stories of God's blessing us financially when we've been faithful to tithe. But we have just as many stories of God's blessing us in other ways. A couple weeks ago, you heard Eric and Jenny Marty's story. They told their story, uh, and then today, you heard Sally Rivera uh, talking about her and Javier's story. And they shared about God providing for them when they trusted God and continued to tithe, even when they moved from a two-income family to a one-income family, God continued to provide financially for their family. And both of them said, can't really explain it, but that's what God has done. Now, that is a financial blessing that, that you just, as I said, you just cannot explain, but it's also a family blessing. You know, it's beyond just the finances. It became a family blessing for them in their particular situation. When we return to God and bring the tithe, I believe the blessings from God will come uh, financially, but also I believe they'll come by giving you, uh, I'm just going to give some examples. You might experience maybe, you know, like a financial blessing, but it might be that you find yourself in need of uh, a new refrigerator. It might be that you need that the, uh, a new car, you, might, you need a, your, your hot water heater goes out, okay? You might find that God somehow miraculously provides that for you when you don't have the money to provide it. Or you might find that that car, uh, that refrigerator, that water heater actually lasts two, three, four, five years longer than it would have otherwise lasted. In fact, here's what I want to read to you again. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Uh, Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe. I mean, I think this is God saying, who knows how I'm going to bless you, but I'll guarantee you I'm going to bless you. The the other thing that might happen is you you might, the blessing you might experience might be that you experience... um, a restored relationship. So it might come in that form. A restored relationship with your child or a spouse or a friend. Over the years, I've told many stories about my parents and my mother and father-in-law. I have recently told some. But my mother-in-law tithed to the Lord off her income from cleaning houses. When she became a Christian, um, she was taught about tithing. She believed it. She embraced it. Um, and her, she, she cleaned houses for some side income, and she tithed regularly off that. My father-in-law was not a Christian at the time and only wanted to, let's call it, you know, tip God whenever once or twice a year he would go to church with the family, maybe throwing a little tip into the, into the offering plate. But uh, he allowed his wife, again, this is generations ago, he allowed his wife to tithe off the money that she made in cleaning houses. She was blessed in so many ways, folks, 
it's, it's really hard to tell you. It's hard to even go into all the stories and the way she was blessed. But one way had to do with a relationship. And it was with her husband, who had not been a Christian for years and years. But you know what? He came into a very real and authentic relationship with Jesus just a few months before Melody and I were married. The reason I'm mentioning these other blessings, relational blessings and you know, surprises where God brings provision or things last longer. The reason I'm mentioning these other things along with financial blessings is because there are a lot of people, we all know this, there are a lot of people who don't tithe, who have a lot of money. Okay, we know this. But they also don't have the blessing that comes with a close relationship with Jesus, which is what this is all about. That full and wholehearted connection with Jesus. You might say, well, I know people who have a lot of money who follow Jesus. Well, I do too. Um, and I think that, that that's absolutely true. But they will not be blessed in this way if they decide not to give, if they decide not to tithe. It just won't happen. They might experience other blessings as they follow Christ, but they're not going to experience the full blessings of having a wholehearted relationship with Jesus. I mentioned last week, it was our 30-year birthday as a church. Oak Hills Church, I mentioned this, that Oak Hills Church started giving to missions before we started the church and before actually we could pay for our staff. We had two full-time staff members when we started and the church who started us were paying our salaries. But some people who were thinking about coming and already committed to come when we started, had started giving some money to the church, started tithing to our new church plant. And the first check that we ever wrote from Oak Hills Church was a uh, missions pledge that we made, I made it, uh, for $100 a month to a brand new missionary. Now, since that time, if you were to look at our annual budget for the last 30 years, what you'd see is that each of the years that we have been a church, we have given somewhere between 10 and 15% of our income to missions, to local and global partners, and to community outreach programs that are around us here. Many of you have heard the story about how we acquired this seven acres of land next door, and I know you've heard it, but if you haven't, I want you to hear it quickly, and if you have, I want you to hear it again. The owner of this piece of property, the seven acres that are over here, um, they owned this seven acres that the church is on as well. At that time, we raised enough money to buy this piece of land. We, he was going to sell that piece of land. He wasn't sure that he wanted to do it right away. And we didn't have the money anyway. And so we were like, okay, well, when you want to sell it, let us know. Because we would like to have 14 acres on this corner. He said he would, but he didn't. In fact, he actually sold the land to a developer. We never even knew that that happened until after the sale. This developer took the land, and at the time there were some structures on there. There was a, a garage and a house. And, and uh, so this developer um, bought the land and then put a lot of money into it <laughs> um, and tore down the house and the garage and put up the fence that you see out here and you know flattened out the hill and the land. So put a lot of money into it. And that developer wasn't very, all the greatest to us as a church. I'll just say that. Uh, and he had a project he wanted to do, which it did not get approved. He had a second project that was approved, but it just didn't get off the ground. He actually had a third then, another idea to use the property. And the whole time um, we were praying that we could get that property because we wanted that property. We even, we even called the developer at one time and said, hey, it's not working out for you. Do you want to sell it to us? And he said, no, I'm not going to sell it to you. And, and so we just kept praying. In fact, one Christmas, we actually had like a Jericho march. Uh, we went around it in, in the snow, just like around Jericho. And we just claimed it. And we believed for the Lord to, to you know, acquire that land for us. And, and then even this last summer, Pastor Matt and some of our youth leaders and some of our kids did the same thing. They walked around, not just this land, but they walked around our whole 14 acres because they were praying for a spiritual renewal in our church 
as we come out of this time of COVID. And it was really powerful as they gathered. But here's a, here's a story. Here's the end of the story. And I'll, I'll end it this way. We ended up getting the seven acres next door. At the time, it was worth, I don't know what it's worth now, but at the time, it was worth like eight hundred fifty dollars to $900,000 for the seven acres. We ended up getting it for free. We just got it. Can you believe that? Um, now, I hate to admit this, but I, I was kind of glad that we got it from that developer. <laughs> he wasn't very nice to us. So the Lord has already forgiven me about that. But anyway... And so, so we got this land, and, and, and I won't go into the detail other than one day I had to go to the place where you sign, you know, the title company. And, and it was just me because they just needed one of our officers. I'm one of three officers of our church. And so I, I was the one. I went down to the title company, and, and I, signed, I signed the papers. And this became, you know, owned by Oak Hills Church. And as I was driving back, I felt like the Holy Spirit say to me, and this is what went through my mind. I started to think about that about the last 15, 16, 17 years. That's about when we, when we acquired the land. I thought, you know what? I bet we've given the value of this land. I bet we've given that much money away to missions these last 15, 16, 17 years. And God just gave it back us with one signature. God gave it back to us. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, listen, you give, you serve where my heart is. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you back home. You don't worry about it. You give where my heart is and everything, and you will experience a great blessing. The land has since over here been used for five years. It was a community garden. More recently, it's been like another space for us in the church, our backyard. We've used it for so many things, services, youth things, uh, all kinds of things. And it's been great. And we're still waiting to see what God ultimately has in mind for the use of that piece of property. But folks, if you want to experience true riches and authentic blessings of God in your life, return to the Lord. Let's listen to the words of Malachi. God says, return to me. Return to me. That's the big message here. Return to me with all your heart and with everything God has given you to steward. Return to me. And we're going to give you a way to, um, to do this. We're going to give you a way to do it exactly what God says, which he says, test me. And so this month at the end of every service, I'm, I'm ending with the 90-day tithe challenge. And so here, let me say it again. Some of you are going to hear it for the first time. Others of you have heard it. But I'm challenging um, those of you who would like to begin to tithe to the Lord. Um, there are a number of people who do tithe already, and, and I'm not talking to you. But if you would like to tithe, you'd like to start giving a tithe to the Lord, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, then I'd like to encourage you to do it. Give you just a little accountability and ask you to, if, um, you can go online, you can go on the app, and you can find on there the 90-day tithe challenge. And this is just where you give us your name, you give us your email, and then you check one of these. I want a, my 90-day tithe challenge is a 10% tithe of my income during the 90 days of October, November, and December to finish off the year. Or the second one, you might want to check that. You go 10%, uh, that is such a jump, okay? Well, here's the thing. You might just say, hey, I'm just going to take a faith step and my tithe during these three months is going to be 1% of my weekly income or 1% of my monthly income or 2% or 5%. Whatever, whatever the Holy Spirit lays on your heart, that you would give that. Now, I just want you to know, it's, this isn't like a bill. We're not going to come after you and say, hey, you signed this. We're not going to do that at all. As I've mentioned each week, we're going to send you a thank you. We're going to send you some encouragement. We're going to send you some scripture and prayer. That's it. But maybe you just want to take a step of faith and say, okay, God, I'm going to do this for 90 days. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to put you to the test. And I'm just going to see what you do because I wholeheartedly want to serve you and worship you with everything that you've given to me. So I want to encourage you to do that today and take on that challenge. So right now, um, let's pray together.
ask the Lord to speak to all of us about this. Would you bow your heads wherever you are, whatever you're doing, just bow your heads. Lord Jesus, we come to you today and we're just amazed that you would say to us, God, hey, put me to the test. And so as a church right now, and for everyone who's attending online right now, I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd speak to them. And if they're hearing that, that call from God, hey, put me to the test, then I pray that they would respond. And they'd say, okay, God, I wholeheartedly want to worship you with everything, including everything you've given me. And I pray that, that we would become a people in this church who, who are wholehearted worshipers of you, and we don't cheat you out of anything, but we are loyal and faithful, and, and, and we love you with all our heart, just like, just like you love us. And so we pray for this, this new understanding of your blessing and how you work and where your heart is, a new insight into this, God, as we trust you in this way. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for attending our online service today. Really so glad you're here. And I'm so glad you're listening and praying about the challenge that I'm giving this month. We'd love to pray for you. And, um, and this is how you can do it. You click on, how can we pray for you? Let us know your situation, your request. And faith-filled people will be praying for you this week. It's a powerful thing to do. It's a step of faith. And I encourage you to do that. Uh, also, if the Lord touched you today in a way, if there's a question you have about the message, if there's something you want to say to me about how the Lord spoke to you today, whatever. You know what? I'd love to hear from you. And so just let me know your story. Send it to me, rod at oakhillschurch.net. And I'd love to read it and I'd love to pray for you. Next week, we're going to finish our series and we're going to finish it. It's called the, the NT, which stands for the New Testament. And I think you're going to enjoy this because if you've ever studied this, a lot of people say that, you know what? The Old Testament was Mosaic Law. The tithe is in the Mosaic Law. It's not in the New Testament. Tithing is not in the New Testament. Well, we're going to explore that next week. And I think you might be surprised at exactly what the New Testament says about tithing and giving. So I hope you'll join us. God bless you. Thanks for being here today.